Greetings, transporters. It's Dr. Kelsey Ralph, and today we are going to talk about the unintended consequences of traffic impact analysis. So remember that the purpose of traffic impact analysis is to avoid congestion when we build new developments. When a developer proposes a new project, traffic engineers use models to determine whether the project is likely to lead to congestion on nearby intersections within the next 20 years or so. If it will lead to congestion, the developer will have to pay to mitigate those impacts by widening a road or installing new traffic signals. This is costly and time consuming, and it leads to lots of lawsuits. Next, let's see how traffic impact analysis shapes developers' decisions. Let's imagine that a developer has picked out a perfect lot downtown. The area is vibrant, many people are walking, biking, and riding transit nearby. The problem is that downtown streets are already pretty congested, and adding this project will add even more delay to the intersections. Engineers calculate that the project will reduce level of service on several intersections to a grade of F. That is bad news for the developer, who will have to pay to mitigate the traffic impacts by widening streets or upgrading traffic signals. What happens if the developer chooses a different location? Imagine that the project is exactly the same, but now it is located 15 miles from downtown on the suburban fringe. There isn't anything there yet, but a few fields with cows. The cows don't have many visitors, so the streets out there are pretty empty. The new project will obviously create lots of new car trips, but by the time the traffic gets downtown, it is dispersed pretty evenly across the entire network. None of the intersections downtown trigger a requirement to mitigate. Even though this project will lead to much, much more driving, the developer might only have to pay to improve one or two intersections, most likely those right near the entry to the development. To recap what we've learned so far, a new project in the city center will have fewer new car trips, but more problem intersections. By contrast, the exact same development on the suburban fringe will have much more driving, but fewer LOS impacts. The decision for developers is clear. To avoid costly mitigation, move projects to the fringe. De developers can use another strategy to lower mitigation costs. Namely, they can shrink their projects. This is bad news because it limits the supply of new units. There are fewer new homes and offices available because we use LOS to assess new projects. To make matters worse, smaller developments also tend to have higher per unit development costs than large projects because the fixed costs of development are spread across a smaller number of units. Anyone who cares about housing affordability should be concerned about traffic impact analysis. So in sum, using level of service to assess traffic impacts affects where development occurs. It makes projects more expensive, it changes the built environment, and it changes how people travel. If you care at all about land use and transportation, this is where the action is at. A new idea is gaining traction in transportation circles. Instead of using level of service to evaluate projects, what if we used vehicle miles of travel, or VMT, instead? In this approach, when a developer proposes a project, we would estimate how many miles of vehicle trips the project would produce over a set period of time. Now, this isn't easy by any means, but many of the steps are the same for calculating level of service. We would still have to estimate the number of trips the project would generate. We'd have to estimate what share of those trips would be by car. And finally, this part's new, we'd have to estimate the distance those drivers would travel. How would the evaluation change if we switched to analyzing VMT instead of level of service? As we've seen in a downtown location, Using level of service to evaluate projects leads to many LOS impacts and high costs for the developer. If we analyzed VMT instead, we would find that projects produced very few vehicle trips because so many people can get there by walking, biking, or riding transit. 
the car trips that do arrive at the destination tend to be pretty short. What about at the fringe? When we analyze the fringe project with a level of service, there are few LOS impacts and the developer doesn't have to spend much to mitigate their effects. If we used VMT instead, we would see that the project developed quite a lot of VMT. Driving is the only option at that location and it is far from everything, so trip lengths are long. Developers would have to pay quite a lot to mitigate their VMT effects on the fringe. As you can see, Shifting to VMT changes the incentives for developers. They're no longer drawn to the fringe. Instead, they're drawn to infill projects downtown. Another benefit of embracing VMT for traffic impact analysis is that the types of mitigations developers provide are more aligned with our urban planning goals. Whereas level of service mitigation is all about widening roads and smoothing traffic for drivers, Mitigation for VMT can be about improving other modes by adding sidewalks or increasing transit service. We have used level of service to evaluate projects for decades. Changing the system will take time, but change is on the way. In 2013, California passed SB 743, which required cities to move away from level of service for their environmental review process, which is known as CEQA. So, to recap, using level of service to assess new developments has the unintended consequence of shrinking projects and moving them to the fringe. Using VMT instead changes the incentives for developers. And finally, California is exploring alternatives to level of service. That's all for this time. I'll see you soon.